Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to dive into your word. And as we embark upon a new journey today, I pray, God, that this will be enriching and strengthening for all those that are here, that we would take the challenge of looking at ourselves in a new way and in a new light. And God, that that light that would shine would be the light of truth, the light that comes from Jesus, the light of the world. And so we pray, Father God, that as we we embrace the light that we ourselves become reflections of it and that we are able to brighten the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So good morning, Next Movement Church, and I'm just glad to have you with us today. We are embarking on a new journey together through the word of the Lord. And we always want to thank our friends at the Bible Project for quality learning materials that they provide because they always help to make our lessons possible. So if you're new here, welcome in. Um, you came at a great time because we're starting a new learning series today. So if you have been here a while, we're going to just say, we're glad to have you back. <laughs> you survived it. And so thank you. You lace up your shoes today because we are going to walk in the word together so that we can confidently walk by faith. Amen. So that's our, that's our job is to walk in the word so that we can confidently walk by faith because walking by faith is not haphazard. It is actually informed. It is in form of who we know God to be and what we know God is capable of. And so we walk with the truth that we know and not by what we see. That's when we say we walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. So this week I'm starting a new learning series. And so this learning series is actually a lead up into a teaching that I promised I would do since the beginning of the year. And if anybody was here with me at the beginning of the year, you know what I'm talking about. And I know that that Monica Scott is smiling today because we are on our way into the spiritual disciplines. Amen. Yay. <laughs> so we are going to be getting into the spiritual disciplines over the next few weeks. And so, but, but we do have some pre-work that needs to be done so we can be of the right mindset going in. Amen. So I just wanted to let you know, if you're sticking around, that this is where we're going. Even when we get into those messages, we might not even dig as deep as we could go or else we would just need to become an entire institute and it would just take too long. But I promise we will cover all the basics of the spiritual disciplines and we will be enriched by doing so. All right. But so today we are embarking on a conversation that really deserves its own series, but we are going to shave it down and because we have somewhere else we need to go. So maybe we're going to come back to this at some point because we could spend a whole year on the image of God. But here we are. So this concept, I'm pretty sure you've heard of, is something that as a believer, you pretty much inherently understand. When you read that you are created in the image of God, you inherently understand that. But it might not be something that you have a really crystallized way to think about it or explain it to someone else. Is that anyone? If that's if that's you, you're like, I could probably use a little refresher on how to explain that to someone. Me, right? I'm with you because I felt that as I was going into studying for this, that this is one of those moments. And amen online, amen on Facebook. I see you too. And so here we are. So today in our time together, let's do some exploration of this topic and we're going to see if we can emerge better together by the end of the day. So stick with me and we're going to make it there. Amen. Amen. So, all right. So our first scripture of the day, we're going to dive into Genesis 1, 25 through 30. So if you're flipping in your Bibles, we're going to Genesis 1, 25 through 30. And I'm hearing, and I'm looking in the chat. They're like, Hey, let's become a Bible Institute or college. I got to get through first. <laughs> I got to get done first, I guess. But all right, we'll, we'll work on it. We got years ahead of us, don't we? So let's dive into Genesis 1, 25 through 30, and we're going to dive in. And like I said, today is a day of exploration. So I'm going to do some teaching and we're going to do some conversation so that we can get to that understanding together. All right. So kicking it off. Here we go. Genesis 1, 26 through 30, as it reads, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock, and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. 27. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, Magdal. He created them. Male and female, he created them. So right, we see the picture of all of mankind being created here, right? He said, I created a species, mankind, in his own image, and which is the image of God. And 
he created breeds, male, female, right? He created them. And so he says here, 28, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. Amen. So the first diet plan shows up right here in Genesis. And on 30, it says, and to all the beasts of the earth and all all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath and life in it. And which is, we talked about this, the Mayim, Hayim, right? Mayim, Mayim, right? We talked about that, the breath of life. And I give every green plant for food. So he said, everything that's on the earth, crawling on the ground, I'm giving them green plants for food. And then the end of this says what? And it was so. Amen. Amen. So as we read it, like I said, today's session is going to be a lot more conversational than some of our lectures. So I hope you're ready to give thoughts and opinions today. And we're going to first start this conversation off with God. With God. We have to talk about this God that does all this creation work in the very beginning pages of this Bible. Let's talk about God. Like I said, that could be its own year worth of study. I kid you not. All of this is like years worth of study. But we're going to talk about God. Let's start with him. And so the Bible calls God, or says God, is this transcendent author of reality, right? When you say creator in many spaces. So he's that author. Think of it that way. He's like the author of reality as we know it. And any knowledge that we have about such a being will always be limited and partial because a creator, by definition, is above and beyond that which is created. Amen? So we can only have so much understanding because we are created beings. We are not the creator. Amen? So the, the story of the Bible recognizes him as this creator of all reality, but it also describes a God who is very relational. And this relational God is one who wants to connect with his creation in a genuine partnership. And this genuine partnership reveals his divine purpose and plan for the world. And not just the people of the world, but all that is created in it. Amen? So it's a divine partnership. I want you to keep that in your mind. It's a, we have a divine partnership with God. And I'll, I'll just put this here, but you know, a lot of times people say, well, why doesn't God just step in? When there's crisis, why doesn't God just come in, bang, fix it? Because we are in a divine partnership with God. He has given us, we have an agreement that we have X amount of things we take care of that he's given us rule and reign over. And then there's the things that he, he takes care of. And, but he's given us authority over certain things. And so some things are well in our control, but as human beings, we usurp that to our feelings and our desires. But that's another, that's another topic for another day. But understand that what we're in right now is a divine genuine partnership with God. And this is going to be critical to understanding how we understand God. And so when God appears to people in the Bible, he's both understandable to them, he, or he makes himself understandable to them. As it, and the way that you see that manifested is people seeing God, saying they've seen God, or people saying, hearing God, I've heard the Lord, or even interacting with God as a person or divine beings being sent on his behalf, like angels. And, but he also not only makes himself understandable, God also breaks their ideas and categories of him at the exact same time. He makes himself tangible and mysterious all at the same time, tangible and mysterious. So in essence, you really can't put God in that box. Like we like to say, you can't put God in a box because he will make himself as tangible as he needs to be or as mysterious as he needs to be. But in all of it, he's still God. So sometimes we have answers and sometimes we don't have answers. But he's still God, whether we have the answers or not. Amen? You, you tracking? Good. All right. So if we have to slow down, we will slow down. 
So my, the fourth bullet that I have in on this slide in particular is of God being complex, which is something that I alluded to in my last comment. God is complex, but he reveals himself in a concrete way through Jesus. So if you're writing, that's for you. God, in all of his complexity, as complex as, as hard as it is to maybe understand the workings of God, he reveals himself through Jesus Christ. So as we study Jesus, we understand God, right? Because as Jesus had said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, amen? So, and remember, he's a part of, all of them are part of that Godhead. But understand, you're, we are seeing a revelation of God, the revelation of God in flesh through Jesus Christ. And this is one that really deserves much more attention than we give it, but, and much more than we can really give it in this study. But what I will say is, although we are able to articulate and we are able to articulate what we believe the relationship of God is with himself, which we call the Godhead, but it doesn't mean that we understand it fully. Amen. So we can talk about fathers. We talk about father, son, Holy spirit. We talk about those things. We can give a construction of it. But we don't, it doesn't mean that we fully understand the operation. Can we agree? And we don't always fully understand the operation of it. And so our understanding of God is limited because God is inexhaustible, period. And so, yes, I see you in the chat here. It's a, yep, we're not on his level. There's just things we're not going to understand. And that's okay, North Americans. <laughs> Okay, it's okay that we don't always understand. Amen. But with that being said, there are a few things to think about when we consider Jesus's orientation to the Godhead. And we're going to need this in order for us to understand ourselves in the image of God and eventually understand why we need the spiritual disciplines. Because if you don't have a right mindset, a right understanding of what your position is in the picture, you will, you will misuse the spiritual disciplines or try to give them, make them give you results they were never intended for. I'm going to leave that till next week. I'm going to leave that till next week. All right. So let's talk about what this looks like. Um, maybe some of you have seen an image like this before. If you haven't and you do it, it is this graphical representation talks a bit about the relationship between God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as we understand it or what we, as we believe it to be. And so from this, you can see that each person... You can see that each person of the Godhead is represented. And so it is the God, each person in the Godhead here is represented very distinctly. You see those circles, those dark circles. You see father up here, son in the corner, Holy Spirit over here on the same level. And so they are distinct and unlike the other. That's why they say the son is not the father. The father is not the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is not the son. But still, in all their uniqueness and diversity, they are a single, inseparable unit, as is represented by the colors in the middle. So I, it's not distinctly the Father, distinctly the Son, or distinctly the Holy Spirit, though they are distinct, but it is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together makes up God. Like I said... It is explainable, but it does not mean that we fully understand the operation. We know that it exists, though, because of the ways they've chosen to reveal themselves through the word. Are you there? Good. I hope you're tracking. So, all right, let's go. Let's go a layer deeper with that. I think one way that we could think of this, if you need this diagram may help, but here's another way I want you to think of it. If I could simplify it a little bit, we tend, we could think of the father as the architect. He's the designer. He's the author. He's the source. He's the sender he, and the planner of salvation. He's the architect. He's the, he's the structure, created the structure of all things that exist. And then we can see that the son is the accomplisher. So you can have the architect and the accomplisher. He is the accomplisher of the plan. He's the one that came to execute the plan, put it in motion and complete it. And then we have the Holy Spirit, 
who's more like the applicator or the one that applies salvation. He applies salvation to the person receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior. In our cases, he, you know, receives him, we receive him as the accomplisher and king, right? So the Holy Spirit is here to make sure that the work continues and is carried out in each person and everybody. He's like the governor of the province. You have, you know, you have your king and then you may have, you know, your, your ruler, the territory of Jesus and who's the king. And then you also have the Holy Spirit who's like the governor of the territory <laughs> who comes in to make sure that things go the way that they should. Okay, so then whatever imagery works best for you. So you can look at the diagram and see that they're distinct but intertwined. You can think of them as architect, accomplisher, and applicator. Whatever it takes for you to understand that they are very distinct but still one unit. And one that is still inexhaustible to all of us. <laughs> all right? So, and to be honest, this is still too simple of a representation. I'm going to tell you why. Because and why we can never simplify it down to something that we get completely. Because we see Jesus as he addressed God as my father. But he also claimed that he and the father are one God of the Bible. And when Jesus experienced the love of the father, it was through the personal presence of the Holy Spirit. Right? You see, so it's complicated. It's complex. And both who is both, and you know, the Holy Spirit is still, who is both Jesus and the Father, yet distinct from them both. So, like I said before, it's very, it's a very complex situation that is, again, in my opinion, completely inexhaustible. So, Mike, the takeaway I want you to get from this is this. Jesus, in Jesus, we see the most perfect portrait of this creator being who is an eternal community, He's a community in himself of unified love. He's, he is part of an eternal community of unified love. And they are three in one. Three beings, one being. What, if we tease it out completely, I don't even know if it's beneficial. We just need to know that these are the roles, this is what they play, and this is how it impacts us. Is that fair? Fair enough? Fair enough? Who's, who has a lot more questions after that? me but <laughs> but it crystallizes some things but it also brings more questions doesn't it it does that's why i say inexhaustible but we should still understand that the way we see represented the way we are able to articulate it is that we understand that there is a father role the role of the father the creator the source the abba and then we also have the son as was represented through jesus christ connected to the father abba also submitted and then the holy spirit which was the one promised to come after Jesus ascended and is now who is in the earth and applies salvation as people receive Jesus. So maybe that needs its own infographic. Maybe I'll make one one day. Maybe I'll make one. In all the free time that I have, I will make one one day. How's that? All right. Amen. So let's, let's go back to the scripture. I just wanted to throw that out there that we're talking about this God that is in eternal community, right? We talked about this God that's in an eternal community loving community with himself. So if you understand God to be in this eternal loving community in himself, for us to say that he has a genuine partnership with human beings, a loving relationship and partnership with human beings becomes a little more digestible because this is a God that is already existing in the community of love that is a community of love. So the relationship with human beings he has is also one of love, love and community, love and community. You can't be an island, love and community. Amen. Somebody say love and community. Send me a love and community because you're going to need this for where I'm going next. Love and community. This God is represented by love and community. Even if you're on Facebook, love and community. Remember love and community. All right. So when we go back into the scripture again, and I should read it one more time because we're going to transition. When you read this, it says, then, then God said to us that love, that community, that eternal loving community. He says, let us make mankind in our image. Thank you, Facebook. Love and community, right? So we have this eternal community that says, let's make man to be like us. Let's make man 
to represent us, be, be many statues, so to speak, of us. And they're going to be in our likeness, so they're going to be like us. And so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the livestock and the wild animals and all the creatures that move along the ground. But rule the way that we would as an eternal community of love. huh? And so then he goes on and then they create this, this species, mankind, in their own image, right? In the image of God, in my deal. And he created them, male and female. He creates them, creates two, two types. And then he says, God blessed them and said, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the air, fish of the sea, birds of the air, and every living creature that moves on the ground. That was, the, that was what he said. And then he says, I give you all these plants to eat. Go ahead and eat them. Everything that's got seed, go eat it. And then he says, he gives the creatures the same plan. He says, go eat the plants and everything will be all right. And so we got that picture that this was a, a world that was created in love, in community, in support, and, and that was born to have diversity and to also be interconnected with each other, right? Do you get that sense? Do you get that picture? I want you to have it visually in your head. If you get that, give me a yes, or at least it's your head nod. Does that feel like that to you? That God creates this beautiful garden of world. I hope so, because if you get that, you're going to need that, that image for this, where we're going with the next slide. Amen. I see it in the chat. Thank you. So here's what I want you to consider. Because when going back to the scripture, going back to the scripture, we see God appoints humans as his representatives to rule the world on his behalf. The image of God consists of male and female together ruling in unity over all creation. And this is a really bold vision of humanity and human identity and responsibility that you are created in the image of God and that you are created to be his representative in the world and to rule the way he would rule over all that's within it. You have the authority to do so, but you're also expected to do it the way he would. And it's so it's, you have responsibility. All right, let's move forward. It is also, what we've just described here, is also a vision of humanity that has some similarities, but many differences to the thinking of that day. Now, I know we have our thoughts and feelings of how we believe, but in context, and you know how much I love context clues, like my daughter says, context clues, mom, here's the context clues. Let's talk about what this idea or this concept of God and humanity is in comparison to other thinking of the day. Is that of interest to anyone? What does that really mean? That, okay, we know what it means to us. Because the thinking of the day was very different. And the best example of this is these two tablets that you see here on the screen, or three. These tablets on the screen here. These were discovered in Nineveh. And they are called the Enuma Elish. And they're often called, in English, they'll often call them the Babylonian Genesis. Okay? So this is like the beginning, the creation book story of the Babylonian Empire. So these are discovered in Nineveh. And if you do the history, and I know I got some history and creation story buffs here on, uh, in, the, in the house. So I see you out there. Um, but knowing this, it has some similarities, such as God creating order out of chaos. So that's something that would have been familiar for other people of the day outside of the Hebrew people. But, and so between the order and chaos... And then also not creating something out of nothing. That's also another thing is that the world wasn't created out of nothing. They also believe that light exists before creation of the sun, the moon, and the stars. So that there's this essence of light. There's some kind of light force before sun and moon and stars are created. In, in Genesis, they call that the, the lights that are fixed in the firmament, firmament. You know, we talk about that. And they also believe in this Emunah Elish that there's a sequence to creation, that there's water, there's land, there's lights, you know, all of these things go in a certain order, which is very similar to what happens in the Bible. 
And so there are a lot of people who are historians that at first were saying, well, did the Hebrews just borrow this information? Did they borrow this information of this God? But again, like I said, there's always the, what is these stories designed to do? Are they designed to explain something in particular? or are, And what is that thing that they're attempting to explain? And again, as I said last week, and I believe it was last, no, two weeks ago, I said two weeks ago, you must be thoughtful to make sure that the book that you read does what it's designed to do. And so if this, these are also explained, and they are designed to explain a very theological position. Just like Genesis is there to explain a theological position, so is the Emina Elish there to describe a theological position. So for us to know that this is the order that they believed in, that they believed the world was created in is not enough. We have to understand what they, why they believe the world was created and what our role is in creation. Can we agree on that? We need to not only know what was done, we need to know why it was done and what role do we play in the picture. So before I go any further on this, I'm going to ask you a question and anybody can unmute and answer. But if you could tell me quickly, in, in our Hebrew Bible, as we read it, tell us, tell somebody explain to me or give me an answer, any answer you got, why were we created, who created us, and what are we created for? We are created to praise God. Mm-hmm. And what was the other question? And so who created us? God created us um, for his glory. Amen. So I've got God created us for his glory and for praise. Amen? Mm-hmm. Cool. Any, Amen. Anybody else want to chime in? You're up. Come on in. We're talking today. What did we read in Genesis? Who created us? We're done? Yep. Come on in. Okay. So um, God created us. God is love. God is, ex- or love is expressed with another. Mm-hmm. I like this idea too. So, so I get now I'm getting the sense of why, wow, what, what was, what was surrounding that? What was the positioning? So God, you said God is love. I see God is love and that we were created for what? Say that one again. I said, uh, love is expressed when you have another to love. Mm. So you're saying that God created us as beings to, to be loved. To be loved and for us to love him. Amen. So he's extend. So it sounds like you're saying he extended his community. Yes. Nice. So I have an extension of the community of love. So we so we read here together, and I thank you all for time. And anybody else want to join in? You can jump in at any time. And so we have again where we said we have this community of love, this Godhead, this three in one that comes and creates these beings. And they said that, and this community that is interfixed in love and fellowship decides that it's going to create another set of beings that are just like them and are here to have authority and rule over a territory and to rule it the way that we were designed to do it like him, right? So I want you to remember that as we go talk about the Enua Elish now, because I just said to you that this Enua Elish, which is a creation story, the Babylonian story that existed around the time of Genesis or written to speak to the same things has the same order of things. Like we said, in the beginning, God created the dot, the dot, the dot. I mean, Elish does the same thing. It says, hey, you know, we have, you know, this is the order. We have chaos, and then we're creating something out of this chaos. And in this chaos, we have sun and the moon and the stars, but there's a light before it, and there's water, land, and lights. But now let's talk, like I said, let's talk about what the what the real essence of creation is about. And you'll see how, I want you to tell me how different it could be. All right, take a look at this. See, where we begin to see a stark difference between this thinking of the day and the Hebrew Bible of the day is where we see how these things were accomplished. How did we get to this creation of the world? And so in the Enuma Elish, the symbol of chaos is this goddess called Tiamat. And Tiamat personifies the sea. Okay, so I'm going to take you on a journey here so you can see the thinking why why this is such a challenge for people to 
to this tiny, tiny group of Hebrew people were coming to stir up an entire thinking of the world. Because remember, the Hebrew Empire is this big and the Babylonian Empire is this big. The Hebrew Empire is this big and the Egyptian Empire is this big. <laughs> okay? So I want you to remember, this tiny group of people show up with this idea that we have this loving God that has partnership and, and we have rulership with him. But then we're about to go into this completely different story, which was actually majority thinking of the day. Okay? Majority thinking. All right. Yes, uh, I want to add in this. God is God of creation and love. I like what I'm hearing in the chat from, from Camilla. She says that God is creation and love and we are to multiply his love with order, authority, and responsibility. God's name will forever reign. Amen. Nice, nice segue. I paid her to do that. So here we go. So here we go. The ending of Elish, again, like I said, is this, we have this symbol of chaos, which is the goddess Tiamat. And she personifies the sea. And on the screen, and you can read along with me, and I want you to compare and contrast how this creation account is different than what we read in Genesis 1. So take notes if you have to, because I want to talk about it after. And it says here, and this is something I got from research. It says here that this is one series, these cuneiform tablets that you're looking at, is one series of narrow cuneiform tablets that tell the story of creation of the gods Apsu and Tiamat out of primordial waters. This particular this particular relates, this particularly relates to the episode in which the god Anshar summons the gods to create to celebrate Marduk's appointment as champion following his defeat of Tiamat. Okay, so I want you to see there's characters here, right? The Apsu and Tiamat pre-exist. They're like the pre-existing ones. And they are talking about another god created called Marduk that champions over his defeat of Tiamat, which I said is the symbol of chaos, this goddess of chaos. And it says here, the younger gods disturb Tiamat and Apsu, her husband. So Tiamat and Apsu are husband and wife. So they're a picture of unity in themselves, right? It's a picture of unity. So Tiamat and Apsu, her husband, decide to destroy them. However, before he can act, we're talking about Apsu, he is killed by the gods. Tiamat is enraged and gathers an army of monsters and demons and marches in revenge. The gods gather in assembly at first and at first are unable to face Tiamat. Eventually, Marduk, a young god, steps forward and offers to fight Tiamat in return for the throne of heaven. So again, remember, we have these two these two pre-existence, pre-existing gods, always was, always will be kind of thing. And they have these other gods that are basically birthed out of them. And there's a spat, there's a bunch of disputes, they frustrate them, and then they, her husband goes after them, her husband God goes after them, he is killed by these gods, and so she, she blows a gasket and becomes complete chaos and sends out monsters and demons to fight them. And at first, these gods are unable to face her. She is too powerful. And so eventually, Marduk, this young god, steps forward and offers to fight Tiamat in return for the throne of heaven. So for rulership of heaven. And the gods agree, and Marduk gathers his weapons. Tiamat's army is defeated, and she is what? Killed. Now, remember, this is all before Earth. And then it says here, from her body, Marduk creates, splits her, splits her in two, and Marduk creates the heavens and the Earth. You understand that? So out of this chaos and fight, this god of chaos is defeated. She gets, when she's killed, she's split in two, and they separate her. And she becomes the heavens and the earth. And from the blood of a defeated giant, 
Humans are created to what? Serve the gods. This is interesting, isn't it? <laughs> I like what Lisa said. The series, humans created to be slaves. Yep. That's exactly what you get out of that. It says here, once they, so out of chaos, Marduk comes, suits up, defeats her and the demons, splits her in half, boom. We get the heavens and the earth, and then this blood of some of these defeated giants, they create humans, and they're created to serve the gods. Hmm. Wrap that around your brain. So I said to you, before we started this story, what did I say? I said, when you read the account, and this is why history, we're studying history is not enough. You have to understand not just what they said happened, but what they believe. We have to understand what was the, what is this about? This is about a theological position, right? So we've gone from, yes, we believe that there was chaos on the surface. There was chaos. There was this light. Things were created in a certain order, blah, blah, blah. I'm just giving you just the basics of the story. But this is the background that you need to understand. So can you imagine Hebrew, uh, Hebrew of the day or a Jewish person of the day? And they're talking to someone from, Bab from Babylon. And they say, I believe in God. Now, have you ever had that, that conversation with another person? It's like, they say, I believe in God. You say, me too. <laughs> have you ever done that? It's like, I believe in God. Me too. And say, but oh, what do you believe about, what God do you believe in? It's like, what do you believe about God? What God do you believe in? And they would need to explain, and they would start off with similarities in the conversation. Well, I believe that God did this, and I believe that God did that. I believe there's creation. I believe there's chaos. I believe there's light. I believe there's this. But when you get down to the core of the story, we have a very different idea of what that meant. So stories like the Enuma Elish give us a really brief but important glimpse at how ancient Near Eastern people thought of beginnings. And the Israelites of the day would need to ask themselves how their God ranked in the ancient world. They would have to ask themselves that. How did my God, how does my God rank or stack up in this ancient world? <clears throat> and so, and there are dozens of gods, as you can see, even just in this story alone, we've got a we got at least five to six gods we can name. That does not include the people of Egypt and what they believed, which was also another superpower at the time. So more importantly, we need, they would be asking themselves, what made this God that we serve worthy of devotion rather than the gods of the superpowers like Babylon and Egypt? Hmm, lots to think about, right? Yes, cultural reference is extremely important when we read our stories. And so... Pete Ennis um, said something really, really, really cool. And I think that he had said it in context. There we go. Pete Ennis said something really interesting. Um, he's a professor of biblical studies at Eastern University. And he said this in a really useful way for me. He said, Genesis 1 is a bold declaration that the God of a tiny nation with a troubled past is the one responsible for everything that you see. The gods of the superpowers didn't do it. Yahweh did. And in the ancient world, those are fighting words. <laughs> okay? It's like, you're trying to tell me that you itty-bitty troublemakers over here, Israel, y'all, this, that you people, you little nomadic people, are your God is responsible for all of this? We're the superpowers here. How do you explain and so, you know, those would really be fighting words. All right. So now that you had the opportunity to hear two completing, competing theological views for the context of the day, I want you to take a couple minutes and just gather your thoughts and answer a couple questions for me on the screen. I want you to, so you can always go back to Genesis 1 and 26 through 30 if you have your Bible with you to reference. But yes, Lisa, very much a na-na-na-boo-boo, my God's better than yours was going on. Absolutely. So I want you to think about this, and I'm going to show this up on the screen. Here's some questions for you. Here's some questions I want you to think about. And if you're on Facebook, you can join in too. 
when we explore Genesis 1, 26 through 30, and we're only going to take like three minutes to write your thoughts, um, you know, who, who is created in God's image? You know, and which account that we just read supports that view? Who is that? And you're, you're free to chime in anytime. If you want to, if you want to open up your mic and speak, you can. So, you know, like who's actually created in God's image? According to the creation stories that we've read. And which of, which of these accounts actually support that view? Does the, I mean, the Ellis support that? Does Genesis support that? Yep, I'm seeing that. Okay, so I'm seeing humans are created in God's image. Amen. And which creation account supports that? Genesis. Yeah, Genesis does. So what I want to ask you or what you can write or you can share is what does that mean for how you view yourself and others? What does it mean for how you live your life? You know, what is it? And the last question I have for you is what do you think of it says about God that he invites humans to rule with him? That's what I want to know. What, do you, what does it say about this God that he's inviting humans to rule with him? If that's the, if that's the standpoint that we sit Ah, on Facebook, I'm getting here. Thank you. Since we are all created in God's image and Genesis supports that. Amen. Amen. I'm sending a wave out to Facebook. Amen. So I also see him coming in here in the chat. Yes, human. Yep. God created us in his image, humans. And Genesis supports that view. Amen. Any more ideas? Any more thoughts? You're free to share. Come on, Indiana. I see you coming in. Let me unmute her. Your iPad too? Okay. Come on, Indiana. God is love. He created us in love. He expects us to love through his power. Amen. Yeah, so, so you can see we're created very much in love. We're created, like we say God is love, but we are created in love. And so again, he expects us to, to rule as such. Amen. I love it. I also hear see on Facebook, it says he's Peggy says he is the true leader. He shares with his children. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Amen. Also coming in here in the chat, it says, that means that when you make other, when others make you mad, you have to remember they are also created in his image. Ooh, he loves them too, doesn't he? Yes. He created all of us. We are, we are a very special creation. He created us to be like him and with him and rule like him. Amen. I see, I see my baby girl in here. She says, he lo oh, he loves me. He loves you. He loves everyone. Yes, he does. You go 12. You go 12 year old. That's right, kids. You chime in too. So this is important. Ah, I see Camilla comes in and says, Genesis 10, 9 through 10 further explains the importance of the personal relationship with God. He reveals himself to us in unique ways, complex, but inviting all regardless of cultural difference, native tongue, etc. Amen. Woo! Good responses. I, lo I love this. So what we're getting here, though, so if I'm looking at it, question one, yes, I, I say amen too. Send them amens in. Yes. And so what we have here is that God is, who is created in the image of God? Human beings. All of them. <laughs> Let me say it again. Who's created in the image of God? Human beings. All of them. All of them. And so... And which creation account supports that view? The Bible. And not many of the day would, would come, there's almost none of the day that would come even close. We just read one account of many. You got to also consider the Greeks in the picture eventually, which all believe that there's like this pantheon of gods that just created you to be a servant or a, not even a servant, but a slave to them and not in relationship. Okay. And then and what does it mean for you and how you view yourself and others? Hey, we, we got to remember that every single person created is created in that image. Whether they live up to that or not is not your business. Amen? Whether they're living up to it or not is not your business. That's God's business. Now, we have a responsibility to speak truth and love and stuff. I don't have a, trust me, another conversation. But understand that they too are created in his image and we should treat and respect them as such. Amen? Amen. So, all right. So let's move on. Let's move further. All right. Thanks for sharing your thoughts with me. And thanks to all of us. And sharing aloud really does help us to process and learn together. So I'm going to encourage you as we're, as we're going through this, process out loud, type, 
whatever you got to do, but we're going to go through this together. We're going to get there together. All right. So our second scripture for today is coming from Psalm 8. So if you want to go to Psalm 8, let's go there. You can follow along on the screen. And so we're going to read it. There's about nine, nine verses here. I'm getting some more coming in the chat. Yep. Other creation stories say humans are born from some sort of death. Yes. God creates us from the abundance of his life. Yes. Good observation. Exactly. We are, we are born and created out of chaos, according to other groups. And that is not what God said about us. Amen. Amen. So let's go to Psalm 8. If you're following along, follow along with us, Facebook, come, come on the ride. And so it says here, reads here, for the director of music, according to Giddeth, a Psalm of David. The Psalm of David reads, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. So I'm going to use the, you use the littlest of them, babies, to quiet your enemies. Mm. And so when I consider the heavens, your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Wow, God, how human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with your glory and honor. You made them rulers over the work of your hands. You put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds, and animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim in the paths of the sea. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And the church say, amen. Woo, you see, woo, I love the scripture. So here in Psalm 8, we see this poet, this writer um, who writes for David or David is reflecting on humanity's identity and true calling to rule creation with God, right? Remember, I always say to you that you're you're calling, when people always ask me, you know, how do I know my calling? And I I always say, my my answer is always the same. So your calling is to live a life with God for the sake of Christ and others, right? I always say that. That is the totality of your calling. There are other assignments that you have along the way, but your calling is to be with God. And this is and this is the proof that it is the most high calling. It says, we see here that this writer is reflecting on humanity's identity and that calling to rule with God, with creation, with God. And through this, and it's a beautiful picture. I don't know if you've ever took the time to really think about this picture, but it's a beautiful picture. And though this really seems like elevated and majestic. Wow, God, we are here to rule this earth with you. What a big responsibility. He still takes the time to reflect in this big majestic rulership that we're so awesome. He reflects and says, humans are really weak and really low. You know, at the same time, you choose these little lowly people to do this amazing thing. He compares And humans are compared to the stars and heavenly beings that God has created. I'm just going to ask this because I need to. Anybody ever seen an angel before or know people who have seen angels before? Or anybody ever read, read about what angels look like? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask you a question? Do those angels look like little, little um, cherub babies that sit on, on your shoulder? (laughs) No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No ham, no turkey. Nope. (laughs) <laughs> that is not, no, not at all. If you ever read the description of angels in the Bible, they are what? Majestic. They're huge. They're huge. They, they probably can't fit in my house because maybe just the foot of an angel is in my house. They're, when you read the description of angels, they are huge. So what we're saying here is that this author took the time to discuss that we have these low humans and they can be in, he compares them to the stars and these heavenly beings. And still, somehow, 
God is pleased to partner and share his glory with these human beings. What an honor. He has all this magnificent creation with power untold. And he still takes us little fragile things. And the older we get, it seems like the more fragile we get. Good grief. You know, you know when you watch babies, they, they run and they fall into stuff. They bump and, hey! and you go, yay. And they go, uh-huh. And they get up and they keep running. Let me bump into the corner of my chair or counter today. And I promise you I'll be hospitalized. Okay? Me. Okay, and so so think of this. We are so fragile. We can't even bump into anything and not be hospitalized. But he says, rule. What an honor. What an honor. Let, look at verse four, 4 and 5 again. I want you to take a look at verse 4 and 5 again. Us fragile beings, fragile rulers. I'm going to call you fragile rulers. <laughs> Let me talk to the fragile rulers today. Um, verse 4 and 5 say this. Psalm 8 says, what? He's like, what is mankind? Like, what's so fantastic about man mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. I mean, you made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. These fragile things who, if they're in the rain for too long, are going to get sick. And you're going to let them rule the earth. Wow. Take a moment. I want you to write down a couple of words or thoughts that stand out in the scripture for you. Because I'm going to go somewhere with that. There's some things that jump out to you as you read that. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? And human beings that you care for them. You made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. Ooh. I see coming in the chat, A4, the real mystery of the gospel is he actually cares what we think and feel. Ha, yes. Woo, that feels good. What is that? Get yourself a couple notes there. Amen, amen. All right. So as you're writing that, as you're writing down a couple, getting your heart and feelings around that, you got some thoughts? Good. So now I'm going to show you that scripture again. Yes, I see. We are his children and what the father would not want us to do is the best. Oh, yes. I like that, Camila. I like that. So I want you to have your thoughts. You got your thoughts? And I'm seeing the thoughts coming in. Yes, I see on Facebook. Why do you care? It's like, God, why do you care? Why do you care so much? Why do you care so much about these fragile beings, right? And so I'm going to show you this scripture again. I'm showing it to you in a different translation. And I'm including verse 3 this time. I'm going to bring verse three into it. And I'm going to read this in the message real quick because I, I wanted um, you to hear this a, a slightly different way. Psalms eight verses three through eight reads, I look up at your macro skies. Okay. So this, the expanse, this firmament, I look up at this, at your macro skies, dark and enormous, your handmade sky jewelry, moon and stars mounted in their settings. And then I look at my micro self <laughs> and wonder, why do you bother with us? Just like I see here on Facebook, baby. Yeah, why do you care? <laughs> you know, why do you bother with us? Why take a second look our way? Yet we've so narrowly missed, even though we're these micro beings, we've so narrowly missed being God's. Bright with Eden's dawn light. Hmm. You are so magnificent. I just want to tell everybody listening today that you are so magnificent in all your flaws. You know what this is like for me? Um, here's, here's something probably not as great as an example, but it worked. You ever see those movies or see, know somebody yourself? Well, let's just stick to movies. You ever, you ever see those movies where you have these people in high school and you got the little, you got the girl who's the ugly nerd, right? Or supposedly the ugly nerd. If it's Disney, they do a terrible job at this because they really get pretty cast members and throw glasses on them and then make you want to try to believe that girl's ugly for that time being. But, <laughs> but you get this, you get high school and you get this, you get this, this, this girl and she's supposed to be this ugly clumsy nerd, right? 
and all of a sudden she gets discovered by the most popular person in school. And she, and when she gets discovered by this most popular person in school and he wants to date her now, or she's going to go to the prom or some business. And now she take, they take off the glasses and they, you know, they get her and she, oh, and all of a sudden she's this beautiful princess, right? But she still has this nerd, ugly Betty. Yes, ugly Betty. And so, but she still has this nerd complex, right? Or this ugly complex. She's like, but why do you see me? Why do you, why do you see me? Why? There, there's so many other magnificent ones around. Why do you see me? Ugly duckling. Yes, Aja. Ugly duckling. It's like, why do you see me? Now, granted, she's fantastic. She is fantastic. But her concept of herself is, hey, why me? And, you know, it's almost as if the psalmist is writing from that perspective that you have so many more magnificence in the world, God. You created this beautiful macro sky that has no beginning and end from what we can see. And you have all this magnificent, as said, sky jewelry. These sparkly stars and moons and stuff that you place so carefully in the sky. As a matter of fact, so carefully that they show up almost in the same spot for us every day or in every year. And they sparkle so bright and light the whole earth. And still someone there, somehow you take us, these little macro beings, these little ducklings, these little Bettys, <laughs> and you somehow say, rule with me. Hmm. You know, when we read the poem in this way, you know, we see this author portraying humans as both weak and tiny, but also glorious and capable. So you don't get the opportunity, you don't get to just stay in the weak and tiny. You're also glorious and capable. So my question for you then is, do you see yourself in this way? And if not, then what would change if you did? I want you to write your thoughts. You don't have to share that with me. I'm going to give you a minute. Write that. So, do you see yourself in this way? You may sometimes be weak and tiny, but you're also very glorious and very capable. And, you know, if you don't see yourself in this way, what would change for you if you did? How would you live differently? Hmm. Yes, yes, Asia. Flat twist. Angle. <laughs> what would change for you if you saw yourself this way? Mm-hmm. All right. So we're getting really close. What time is it, buddy? Uh, Thank you. So, okay, so we're getting close to ending our session for today. So I'm going to dive into one more grouping of scripture, and then we're going to be ready to move into new material next week and also move to communion. communion. And communion. Go back where you were. <laughs> you have your own space. Let me do my thing. All right. Oh, I love what I'm seeing in Facebook land. Facebook says, um, I never saw myself that way. However, as I miss you and my faith, I'm starting to see myself that way. Oh, yes. That's beautiful. I'm telling you, we, we need to see ourselves that way. We, because this is how it's described to us. This is how we're described. There's, there, you are what you are, but you are magnificent the way he created you. You are whatever you are is enough for him to get done what he needs to do. Can I say that again? Whatever you are is enough for him to get done what he needs to do. Whatever you are is enough for you to get done what he needs you to do. Amen. Deanna used to say that all the time. If I didn't get it, I didn't need it. <laughs> she goes, if I don't have it, I didn't need it. So I believe that. Amen. All right. So here's where we're going next. So I want you, last grouping of scriptures. We're going to Colossians um, 1, 13 through 20. So we're going to read together. And then after that, we'll, we'll prepare ourselves for, for communion. <clears throat> so, a little more reading. It says, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. So we're not the cause of the darkness, right? He rescues us from the darkness. He's rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. In whom we have redemption 
the forgiveness of sins. The Son, Jesus, remember the diagram? The Son is the image of the invisible God. He's, he's who we look to to see the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. You see what we were saying that maybe maybe it's maybe it's those who believe in Jesus that are keeping the world together. There you go. And he and he is the head of the body, the church. So he's the head of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn among the dead. So that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on the earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And the church say, Amen. One more scripture I'm going to read from the same book, because like I said, I have a particular agenda for today, so I'm going to stick to it. Colossians 3, verses 8 through 13, same scripture in the same book. But now, here's our continuing thought. So now that you know all of this, now that you know all of this and you understand how we got here and how glorious it is that we are here, it says, but now you, now that you know, you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. So I, every time you read one of these, I want you to say in your mind, rid yourself of, rid yourself of anger, rid yourself of rage, rid yourself of malice, rid yourself of slander, and rid yourself of filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self mm, with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, Barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, all them folks that he just mentioned, th those labels don't matter when we get in Christ. He said, as God's chosen people now, holy and what? Dearly loved. Clothe yourselves with, because we just took off, anger, malice, frustration, stuff. So we're pretty naked right now. <laughs> we're pretty naked, especially if you're wearing that stuff on a regular basis. He says, put these on instead. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So I'm going to go back and say them again. I want you to say, now put on. Now put on compassion. Now put on kindness. Now put on humility. And put on gentleness. And put on, for the parents, patience. <laughs> Lisa says, happy patience for the barbarian. It's hard for me. Just saying. Don't worry, Lisa. There's a song out right now that I completely sing and identify that I got to stop singing, but I mean it. It says, please... It says, try Jesus, don't try me, because I throw hands. And that's the bottom line. It's like, because I fight. <laughs> but you remember, you got to put that stuff away and put on compassion, kindness, humility, 
gentleness, and patience. And it says in 13, bear with each other and forgive one another. If, and if any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Amen, somebody, kind of, right? Can somebody say a, a hearty amen? Squeeze one out? Amen. <laughs> just a, you can just squeeze out an amen. <laughs> forgive as the Lord forgave you. Not as that person will f- return the favor, but as he did for you, you're doing for them. Hard stop. As God forgave you, you forgive them. Period. Period. With a T. Hard stop. As God forgave them, you forgive. I could let it go there. All right, but I won't. So <laughs> in these passages, though, Paul identifies um, Jesus. So let me take it back to where we were today, because I know that that rang for somebody. I'm not going to teach on forgiveness today because you won't come back. So Paul identifies Jesus as the image of the invisible God. We read that in the first in the first group of scriptures in chapter one. And so he identifies Jesus as the image of the invisible God, who is the real king of creation that humbles himself to die on our behalf. And you can see that in verses 13 through 20, right? But Paul also writes then that Jesus' followers are being renewed in the image of the creator. Ooh, that's good to me. So Jesus, we said, image of invisible God. So the physical image of the invisible God, who's the real king of creation, humbles himself and dies for us, forgives us and dies for us. I feel the eye rolls. Lisa, I got you. (laughs) But Paul writes that Jesus, if we're following Jesus, we're following the king of all creation who humbled himself, died for sins. We're following him that we are being renewed into the image of the creator. But what is that image? That image is expressed when we put away certain behaviors and the expression is in compassion. The expression is in kindness. The expression is in forgiveness and other godly qualities. So that renewal, if you want to look like the image of God, that you're made in, you need to express those things. Compassion, kindness, humility, forgiveness. <sighs> you know, there are so many other things we could discuss with these scriptures. I don't have the time um, today. But I think we've done enough to... There's a lot of concepts that we, that we tackled today. So I think we've done enough for today. But today, I want you to focus on these two discussion questions I'm going to put up. And I'm going to put them up because I want you to reflect on them to prepare you for what's coming next week. Because I've now positioned you to understand what we are trying to express. What is it going to take? And I said, these are things that need to be done, right? We need to express compassion. We need to express kindness. We need to express humility. We need to express forgiveness and a number of other godly qualities. But the eye rolls are happening in Zoom land. And you know why? Because I haven't told you how to cultivate that so you can do it. I just told you do it. So when we get into the spiritual disciplines, we can have some conversation on how to get those expressions out. That's where we're going. See, segue, you like that? You like that? So we're going to give you some tools on what this all means. Because they, uh, for me to ask you to do this in just your human self, you're going to fall flat. Let's be fair. The people who need your forgiveness the most 
and the and your kindness the most and your compassion the most are the people that you want to throw as far away as possible. So it's going to take something supernatural for us to get there, but he's given us tools to get there. Amen. Are you good with that? Amen. Are you coming back for the, you're going to do the journey? Who's, who's on for the journey? It, it's life changing. You can get off now, but I promise you, if you stay, it's going to be good for you. All right. So here's what I want you to do. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Yep. Thumbs up. If you're coming back to get on that journey with me, you ready for it? Yeah. 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 Even if you're little. Yeah. I see you out there. Little folks need to learn this too. Yes. Yes. We're going to, we're going on this journey. Yes. Amen. It's true. And when we don't learn it, this is exactly why we do keep falling on our faces because we haven't learned that yet. So, so first I want you to, here's what I'm going to ask you to do today as we're in our reflection time. I want you to first, um, identify the words and thoughts that struck a chord with you the most when you read these passages. Okay. And next I need you to state that I need to state that, you know, both of these passages emphasize God's desire to bring unity to the family through Jesus's example. So this is what they're for, that these passages are helping us to understand that God wants us to bring unity to this human family. That's our job. We are to bring unity to the human family through Jesus as the example. So a lot of the things that we're doing are not because they're right or wrong, like, not because you're right or wrong or haven't been wronged, but we need to be like Jesus and bring unity to the human family because we are to be expressions of that godly community. He is, remember we started with, we talked about God first. God is a inexhaustible community in himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, united in love. And he's asking us, and he said, that I created you in my image. So you are to be a unified human family through the expression of Jesus. Jesus showed you how to do it. So I want you to take a moment and reflect on what it might look like to actively participate in bringing unity in your life or your community, which could be those just around you or those outside of your home. All right. So I'm going to give you those, those questions on the screen for a few minutes, and then we're going to go ahead and go into our communion as we sup with the Lord. Amen. Amen.